and thank you. Wonderful to see a mother and daughter playing together. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Revelation chapter 4. We have been studying the book of Revelation now for several months. I had Eric read Psalm 2 to give us a little more depth of meaning to the passage that we're going to be looking at. And near the end of the message, we'll be taking a little bit of a trip through the, the scriptures in the Old Testament and then eventually coming back to the New Testament, and I think it'll make this chapter much more meaningful. I'm going to read the chapter um, just for our familiarity, and even though we read it last week. So follow along with me as I read. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Let's pray once more. Father, we come to you and I seek your help personally to communicate the truths that, are, that is in your word, to give it the glory that it deserves, the importance. Father, you have given this revelation to us of yourself for a purpose, and may we see that today. May we realize the one whom we serve, that you are the one true God. And we are part of your kingdom. We serve a great king and God. Now may you be glorified in the remainder of this service. In Jesus' name, amen. When you think about the context 
of this book of Revelation. These events that we are beginning really here in chapter 4, the, these, this is the beginning really of the prophetic part of the book. And from this point on, we are going to be looking into things that are very sobering. They are very glorifying to God. But they will show man for who he is. And the Bible clearly states that in the last of the last days, it will be perilous times. Evil men will wax worse and worse, Paul said in 2 Timothy. And when you think it can't get any worse, it will. I don't know about you, but I've pretty much quit listening to the news because there's very little that you, you can even believe. The news is being used by Satan, I believe, to keep Christians from exercising their faith and trying to keep all of humanity in the state of intimidation. And if we, if we allow that as far as God's plan goes, it would be a real detriment to the kingdom of God because we have been saved, we have been ordained for his glory and he wants his church to be pure for the ultimate spread of the gospel and eventually even for the judgment of unbelievers. And friends, God will be glorified. God will be glorified in the redeemed that stand around the throne and God will be glorified in the destruction of the wicked. But I will say that God does not delight in the death of the wicked. He delights in repentance. I think, secondly, it's noteworthy and significant that the book of Revelation doesn't, doesn't begin with how wicked the world is, but with how holy God is. It's very important that we see all of this in perspective. He is sovereign. He is mighty. This is the second vision of God in the book. The first vision was of Jesus Christ specifically in the first chapter of Revelation. Here in chapter 4, there's really a whole different vision. They're still, uh, both were glorified, both were seen as holy, but they were very different visions. And that's because of the purpose of those visions. In Revelation chapter 1, Jesus Christ is walking among his churches. In this passage, God the Father is preparing himself to bring judgment on his creation. Judgment on humanity, judgment on the earth. Revelation chapter 4 should bring us great hope because this chapter is just demonstrating who the Most High God is. I'd like you just to turn briefly with me to the book of Daniel chapter 4. You probably remember the setting of chapter 4. This is Nebuchadnezzar's second dream. And I'm not going to go into the specifics of that dream. But he couldn't find anybody to interpret the dream for him. And so finally Daniel was called forth. 
And he explains the dream to him. And I'm going to start in verse 24. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord, the king. They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven and the seven times and seven times shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. And inasmuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you after you come to know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of the 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty. While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you and they shall drive you from men and your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen and seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. That very hour, the world word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. And at the end of the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever and ever. For His dominion is an everlasting dominion and His kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing he does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom and excellent majesty was added to me now I, kept Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice. And those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. Now friends, that most high God is the God that we're going to be seeing in this chapter. He is over all. Very important because it will, it will help you in understanding this passage. I'm going to give just a quick review of what we covered last week in order to bring us up to where we will be today. First of all, I want us to see God's glory in his position. He is, it says he's seated on a throne. And this throne represents the seat of all authority and power. This throne is a dominant topic throughout the book of Revelation. It's mentioned in 16 of the 22 chapters. It's the controlling force. This is the throne room of the universe in heaven. And it is clear that the one who sits on the throne is the one 
who is initiating the judgments that come upon the wicked of the earth. It's the seat of all authority. Colossians 1, 15 through 17, it says this, that he is the sovereign over the universe. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And that is exactly what we already read here in Revelation chapter 4, that last verse. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the heady, head of the body, the church. Revelation chapter 4, verses 2 through 9 tell us that he is really sovereign over the angels. And in Revelation 5, 9 through 10, he is sovereign over the redeemed. He said, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on earth. But not only that, he is sovereign over Satan over demons and all of rebel humanity. It says in Matthew 25, 41, referring to God the Father, or referring to God, he says that he will say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. The people that he's talking to are those who have rejected Christ as king, rejected him as savior. In 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 28, I'd like you to turn there. He refers then to after the Jesus Christ has accomplished the work that he was sent to do. Verse 24 and following, 1 Corinthians 15. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. And I want you to remember that this, really the, the theme, one of the major themes of the entire Bible is the kingdom of God. The, the part of Daniel that I just read to you, the most high God, wanted this king to realize that it is the Most High God, his kingdom, that really matters. And we see that throughout the entire Bible. So he says, Then came, comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God, the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. See, that is what we're going to be looking at in the remainder of the book of Revelation is how Jesus Christ will put all authority under his feet. Verse 25, or verse 26, The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. In other words, is the exception, and that's God the Father. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. I should, I should also put the Holy Spirit in that, because God the Father, God the, Holy, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are one, and all things will be put under them. Philippians 2.6 says, Who being in the form of God, speaking of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1 verse 2 says, Has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, 
when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He's taking that position over all authority and dominion. Now, from our perspective, from a human perspective, we don't see that. We don't, we don't think of it that way. But he is. This throne also represents judgment as seen by the emanations coming out from his throne. If you'll go back to Revelation 4. I'm skipping a few, a few verses here, but I'm down in verse 5. It says, and from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. And we noted last week that that was referring to God's judgment. Those, those are things that were usually associated with God's disfavor or his wrath. This throne also represented an awesome rever reverential glory. In, in front of it was a sea of glass like crystal. We see that in verse 6. Before the throne was a sea of glass like crystal. And we noted that it was many kings would have, uh, their first of all, their throne and their throne room was beautifully decorated. And we have the king of kings here who is shown in his splendor. And it would be a sight to behold. It would be, if we saw it, we would immediately bow. Prostrate. This was the path of all who would approach the throne. And even these elders and the creatures that we'll be looking at showed great reverence and homage to the one on the throne. All eyes were on the throne. And then God's glory is seen in his person. I'm going to go through this quickly, but I, I meant to have pictures for you, and I wanted to show you these some pictures of these stones. The first one is a jasper stone, which is really one of the most beautiful. And I have seven pictures here. Now, if you read Revelation 21.11, it says there, it describes the jasper stone as, um, as crystal, as something that you can see through. Now, you'll notice that these are not the case. They're beautiful. But the thing we noted that I personally believe is that all of these things, although they have earthly representatives, they will be intensified in their beauty in glory, and they will also be somewhat different, even like gold, the gold of the streets will be clear like glass, it says. It will be that pure. And I believe the jasper stone to some degree. Some people believe that this is actually a diamond. But um, it seems like it would, they would use a different word rather than this one. But in, in Revelation 21.11, it was... It's saying that this jasper stone, stone was known for its brilliant light and its crystal clearness. Now, the other th stones we have no question about. What's interesting about this jasper stone, though, it says that the entire, all of the walls of the New Jerusalem will be built out of jasper. And then it says that the first foundation layer of the New Jerusalem will be made of jasper. Can you imagine an entire wall of a city being made out of something that beautiful and that also refracts light? Let's look at the picture of a sardius stone. And this one, we said, really refers to the wrath of God. It's red. It's fiery red. And it's saying that this person on the throne had the appearance like Jasper and like Sardius. And so this was 
and I believe this will only be intensified as well. And we said that these stones represent brilliant, unapproachable light, beauty and glory. God is a God of beauty. It represents his strength of character, his eternality and permanency. He is our rock. And it's an anchor of the soul. They represent his worthiness to be worshipped. They are precious stones and they represent his omnipotence to bring about judgment. And then it says there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald. And this is what an emerald looks like. I personally think the jasper is much more beautiful. But this is what the, uh, the rainbow was made of, or like, I should say. It was like in appearance. A green, and probably the, the different colors of the rainbow are rather the different uh, hues of green, since it, it says it's like an emerald. And we mentioned that this referred to the covenant that God made with man after the flood. And that was a, a covenant he made not just with man, but with all flesh, animals and everything, that he would never destroy the world by a flood again. It's interesting that this rainbow is present around the throne to remind us of that covenant, which is also a covenant of mercy. Covenant of mercy because God will not bring in one swoop, <laughs> destruction on the entire earth. Throughout that seven-year process will be opportunities for people, and many people will repent of their sins. What a merciful God we have. Praise God. Now I want us to see God's glory as seen in those who worship Him. These creatures... And the elders, we have the elders first. They are, in verse 4, around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones, I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their head. The elders worship. What was their identity? Well, there's... Quite a few interpretations about this. I'm not going to give you all of them, but um, I'll give you what I think is probably the better. The word elder is the same word that's used in the New Testament for elders in the church. And it's the word presbyteros, where we get our word presbyteria, presbyterian from. And it denotes an official position of some sort. So there were three words that referred to the leadership of the church. One was elder. And this word is used only in the Bible, for the elders of Israel and for the elders of the church. And so I believe this refers to human beings rather than angelic beings. Some people have thought that it might refer, since it's 24 elders, it might refer to the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles of the New Testament. And I think that is, an, that is a possibility. For instance, in Revelation 21, verses 1 through 10, where we have the New Jerusalem spoken about, the New Jerusalem represents the believers, the church, and also even those of the Old Testament. And... You have the 12 uh, foundations and you have the 12 apostles. It says they are named in the building of the city, the New Jerusalem. 
But these 12 elders, or 24 elders, probably refer to the church, and they, these are representatives of the church. We don't know who these 24 individuals might be, but some believe that it just refers to the, uh, it represents the church. They're probably representative of the redeemed throughout the history of the church, but it could represent all the faithful to the Lord over the history of humanity. You remember that Elijah and Moses were present in the New Testament when the Lord Jesus Christ was transfigured. That was before they had their glorified bodies, um, and yet we, we, that vision was given to the Lord and also to the disciples. Look at their attire. Their white robes symbolize that they were redeemed and made holy by the blood of the Lamb. Now, there are some that would say that uh, those from the Old Testament are not going to rise until the after the millennium. Uh, I'm sorry, not after the millennium, but uh, right after the tribulation when the Lord comes back in the second coming and uh, there's a uh, resurrection at that time. And that may be. Their golden crown, crown symbolize those who have been given positions of leadership reigning over their delegated jurisdictions, whatever that would be. In Revelation 1, 6, the, rete the redeemed are called kings and priests. In Revelation 5.10, they are also called kings and priests who shall reign on the earth during the millennium. At the second coming of Christ, there will be, um, the Lord will set up his kingdom and there will be those on earth that will, that will help him in ruling the kingdoms of the earth. And they shall reign on the earth during that time. All of the saints will return with the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes back at the second coming. The Bible says the church will judge the world. And I'm giving you this because um, these are all things that could refer to some degree anyway to these thrones that we see. But there's a difference between these thrones in heaven and thrones on the earth during the millennial kingdom. The Bible says the church will judge angels in 1 Corinthians 6, 3. And then the Lord said to his apostles that they will help the Messiah judge the 12 tribes of Israel during the millennial reign of Christ. I'm giving you these because sometimes it can be confusing as you are reading some of these uh, references. And so you have to differentiate between um, the millennial reign and what's going on in heaven with the 24 elders. Let's look at the four creatures worship. These creatures are mentioned over 20 times in the book of Revelation. They are significant in the fact that they glorify God, the one true God. They say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. We believe that's referring to not only his, the fact that he is unique from his creation, he's separate, he's sinless and pure, but it also represents the triune God, each one referring to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is an appropriate praise, especially in light of the emphasis upon his creation. He's, he isn't created, and that's why I've brought that out in verse 11. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. He's different than his creation. His very name means that he is self-existent. He gives life, but nobody else gives him life. These creatures also facilitated the duties of the seven angels that opened the seals and other angels as well throughout the book of Revelation. 
and their appearance, they were angelic beings similar to those described in Ezekiel 1 and 10, but not identical. Uh, when you read in Ezekiel, each one had four faces, but here each one only has one face. They had six wings, similar to the seraphim and cherubim of Isaiah and Ezekiel. The first angelic creature in Revelation 4 had a face like a lion. The second had a face like a calf. The third had a face like a man. And the fourth had a face like a flying eagle. One, one of the things that's interesting from Jewish tradition is that they said that when the Israelites were camping after the Lord um, brought them out of Egypt, whenever they set up camp, the Lord told them that they were to camp in a certain order. And so there were three tribes on each side. First on the east side, the first tribe was, um, was Judah. And the symbol of Judah was what? The lion. And then you had um, Ephraim and after Ephraim, you had Reuben, and after Reuben, you had Dan. Those are the first tribes that were right next to the tabernacle. And each of those were represented by those four creatures that are named here, symbolic of those. Now, I don't know if that's what these are referring to, but the Lord, um, as we know from Scripture, the earthly temple and the way in which God organized the Jewish nation seemed to indicate that there was a similarity to the heavenly temple and what was going on up there. So I only bring that out and it says that they were full of eyes around and within. And although these creatures were not omniscient, they have a comprehensive knowledge and perception Nothing escapes their sight and their watchfulness, especially since they do not sleep night or day. They're immediately aware of happenings pertaining to their judicial responsibility, and evidently they did have judicial responsibility because they helped facilitate the judgments that were coming on the earth. And being so full of eyes without and within, they are able to move their wings without ever dis disrupting their sight all the way around. Their worship together. When the four creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives for and ever and ever, then the 24 elders fall down before him who, sit, who sits on the throne and worship him and cast their crowns before the throne saying, exalting him, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. And notice it emphasizes the Lord's right to his kingdom, which he created. Now I want, I want to take you now, on a little trip through the Old Testament, I want you to think about the fact that the theme that we're looking at is the kingdom of God. Go to Isaiah, first of all, Isaiah 14. And here we have recorded the first instance of one who usurped God's authority. Verse 12 of chapter 14. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. 
For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the the congregation on the furthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. Now notice, he says, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. The stars of God is just another way of talking about the angels. So he was saying he would be above, he would be above all the other angels. And then in verse 1, he says, I will be like God. The Most High. See, the, that title is given to God alone. And here even Satan calls him the Most High, calls God the Most High, but he says, I'm going to be like him. Here was the first instance of one of God's creatures usurping or trying to usurp his authority. Lucifer is called the prince of the power of the air and he is the one who from the point at which he fell energized the rest of humanity in the same rebellion. Now, go to Psalm 2. Here in Psalm 2, it says, Why do the nations rage? The first instance we have in Scripture where the nations rose up against God is at the Tower of Babel. At that point, they were one when they came to Babel. But then do you remember at Babel, their goal was, let's let's build something here. And they they wanted a name for themselves. It wasn't enough to be related to God. They wanted a name for themselves. And so, human history is little more than the nations overthrowing the kingdom of God. We see it all over. It shouldn't be surprising to us when the Ten Commandments are taken out of schools, when they've tried to take the Ten Commandments even off the walls of the Supreme Court. Why? Because they are raging against the kingdom of God. They're raging against traditional family. Not only what God said a marriage is between a a man and a woman, but also between um, just having one man and one woman who are married for a lifetime raising their children. Now they're telling us they're against that. They call it the nuclear family. And we see this happening on every level. Notice as we go on, and the people plot a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. That's the Old Testament word for Messiah. And this is what they say. Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Now look at what God's response is. He who sits in the heavens shall what? Laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision and he shall speak to them in his wrath and and distress them in his deep displeasure. Now look at what he says. Yet I have set my king 
on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree in spite of your raging, in spite of your plotting, in spite of you taking counsel together against all of this. I will declare the decree. And the decree is this. And this is the Messiah now speaking. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now that is what's going to happen in the book of Revelation. Now listen though to what he says, because God is a God of mercy. Now therefore be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. That is the reaction of the God who sits on that throne to the raging of the nations. That psalm was written approximately a thousand years before Jesus Christ came. Now, when Jesus Christ came to this earth, he came, he was the Messiah. He revealed himself through miracles, miracles of healing, miracles of control over natural events, over nature. He raised people from the dead. And yet his own nation rejected him as king. And do you remember what they said? They said, we have no king, but what? But Caesar. And what I want us to see by, by that is that Israel was no different than any other nation in terms of their sinfulness. They are God's chosen people. And God will still keep his covenant with them. But even when the Messiah himself came, Israel rejected him. Now, no one sees God reigning because he's in heaven. That's what chapter 4 is telling us. Therefore, over the process of human history, he has chosen to step into history occasionally to make himself known. Now, one of those incidents was the one that I read to you in Daniel. And he stepped into human history to show this king, Nebuchadnezzar, that no, you aren't the king. I am the king. And that particular time, that king repented and he acknowledged, and I believe we'll see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, Pharaoh didn't want to let them go. And at that time, Egypt was the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. And that's why it was such an important demonstration. And the Lord brought these plagues upon Egypt, which totally destroyed Egypt. 
And yet they still ended up chasing Israel. And we know from the Red Sea. And yet the entire army of Israel was destroyed. Why? Because this king decided to demonstrate his glory through bringing his people out of Egypt and destroying the Egyptians. You remember what happened when Moses first came to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And he, he basically said, who is this God? I don't know him. I'm God, basically is what he was saying. During the judges, the Bible says that every man did that which was right in his own eyes. They did not follow God. They fell away during uh, the period of the judges. You have the divided kingdom. The southern kingdom was Judah. The northern kingdom was Israel. The northern kingdom was entirely pagan in terms of its leadership and in its kings. And they were taken into captivity by the Assyrians. And then we have also Assyria coming up against Jerusalem during Hezekiah's reign. And do you remember as they came up, Hezekiah, it says that he went to the temple, he prayed, and he said, sin for Isaiah. And Isaiah sent back um, a prophecy, but he laid it out before the Lord, that is Hezekiah and, and also some of his, his leadership. And they prayed before the Lord, and I, Isaiah sent back and he said, uh, this man will not even come into Jerusalem. Sennacherib was the king. And that night, one angel destroyed 185,000 Assyrians to display his glory, especially when his people turned to him and did not turn to man for their salvation. Do you remember in Matthew 28 where the Lord Jesus Christ was getting ready to leave the earth? He said to his disciples this, all authority is given unto me. And what he was saying by that is now the Father has given me all authority because this was his gift for what he had done in redeeming mankind and making an opportunity for people to be saved. And he said, I have all authority. Why? Because the king of the Jews is also the king of the universe. When Jesus left this earth, what happened when he went to heaven? Well, in Psalm 110, verse 2, it says, sit, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And that, that quotation from Psalm 110 is the most quoted quotation in all of the Old Testament in the New Testament. It's quoted more than any other one. Why? Because it's establishing Jesus Christ as the rightful king, as the rightful owner, as the sovereign one. The son is being revealed to the world. And what we have happening now in the book of Revelation, that's, what's, that's, that's what chapter 4 is all about. Do you see how it elevates it even more? It, it makes us realize that there's something very, very important, significant going on in all the history of mankind. As Jesus Christ is revealed 
through the destruction and the wrath of God that is being brought upon this world in stages, giving opportunity for people to repent, and yet it's coming. It will be undeniably God because even some of those people who will not repent, they will curse God. They know it's God but they will not be willing to, to repent of their sin. Others will. As we close, I want to read to you a hymn. And some of you probably know it, maybe not all of you. It's been around for, for many years. This is what it says, once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide. In the, in the strife of truth with falsehood for the good or evil side. Some great cause, God's new Messiah, offering each the bloom or bright, blight. And the choice goes by forever, twixt that darkness and the light. By the light of burning martyrs, Jesus' bleeding feet I track, toiling up new Calvaries ever with the cross that turns not back. N new occasions teach new duties. Time makes ancient good uncouth. They must upward still and onward who would keep abreast of truth. Though the cause of evil prosper, Yet tis truth alone is strong. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future, and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. Friends, we need to be always standing on the side of truth, on the side of God, on the side of Jesus Christ. We, time should not make ancient good uncouth. That's what's happening today. It's being thrown aside truth and God's truth and what God has commanded for mankind they're raging against him. But we must go on. And we must stand. We must realize that we are representatives of that God. That's why people over centuries have been willing to die because they've realized that the authority that God has is greater authority than men have. And therefore, we must stand for truth. Make that choice as a believer. Let's pray. Lord, that choice truly has been going on for all history. And we realize that it will go on until our Savior returns. But Lord, help us also to realize that it's not us that is important as much as the one who sits on the throne. And that our lives are expendable for your glory. Help us, Lord. Strengthen us. Give us eyes to see truth in a world that is upside down. And yet, Lord, help us not to go about our life in a way that is unlike our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lived in this world as well. Lord, he spoke against falsehood. But he called 
sinners to repentance. No matter who they were. Lord, we know that you are not a respecter of persons. I pray that you will give us all those qualities, Lord, of Christ's likeness that he had and help us that we would be good citizens of your kingdom. And we look forward to the day when we can stand in your presence around your throne and give you the praise and glory and honor that we see here in chapters 4 and 5. But Lord, while we're here on this earth, may we give you that praise and honor and glory by the way we live. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like you to turn in your hymnals this morning as we close to, I believe it's 188. Let's all stand together as we sing. Jesus shall reign where'er the sun does his successive journeys run. His kingdom spread from shore to shore till moon shall wax and wane. On the third, to him shall endless prayer be made, and endless praises crown his head. His name like sweet perfume shall rise with every morning sound. Thank you, you are dismissed.